Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to night three of Plenary Tracker, bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. I'm Genevieve Jacobs. It's good to be with you again. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Ngunnawal people, and I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, their traditional ownership of this place and commit myself to ongoing acts of reconciliation. And I also acknowledge the elders of the places from whence you join us. This event comes out of an active reform movement. It's intended to prompt discussion and debate and wholehearted engagement. We will have space each night for your questions with a moderator. Please post those in the chat function. Danielle is our moderator tonight. And please let's have respectful engagement and questions that truly take us somewhere useful. James is our technical administrator, so message him through the chat screen if you're experiencing any difficulties. And look, thanks to those who've contacted us to saying they're really enjoying the tracker. I'm the front woman, but I've got a wonderful team from Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goldman behind me. My producer is one Paul Bongiorno. If you've had anything to do with political journalism over the past 30 years or more, you might know that name. And uh, we two old broadcast journos are enjoying ourselves very much. Tonight, a discussion on the Royal Commission the event that cemented the need for this fifth plenary council in Australia. But first, what happened today in the council? We have news from our correspondent, John Warhurst. The virtual plenary heard reports in the public session this morning from 10 groups drawn from the 278 plenary members. The wider church and world got the first direct report of what the members are actually talking about after around about a third of the allocated public live stream was taken up with the introductory prayer, the music, the procedural matters. So that left 45 minutes for disclosure of what was discussed. Spokespeople from the 10 smaller discussion groups gave brief reports on their designated questions, ranging across subjects including Indigenous issues, prayer, mission, leadership, priest formation and parish life. The plenary is assuming a, a, a giant spiritual exercise with words like communal discernment and spiritual conversations, very much the flavour of the day. From the reports, though, it's hard to discern a particular sense of direction from the prayerful sharing. There were some terrific sentiments where they're leading is not clear yet, especially after yesterday when the plenary president, Archbishop Costello, sought to herd the flock into the pen of existing canon law. Nevertheless, one group spoke of the need for new wineskins, of one era of being church in the world ending and prompting a new paradigm of the church. John Warhurst in his blog from the plenary says that members are knuckling down to the task, they're speaking openly, they're revealing their inner feelings and making constructive suggestions. These were diverse, but one thread was strong, not completely unanimous, but thoughtful and passionate advocacy for women preaching. John says, like many members, I continue to benefit from reinforcement in, and encouragement from within and outside the council membership. My concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn colleague, Francis Sullivan, whose brave initial intervention yesterday morning on the issue of women's participation in governance and ordained ministries made me so proud, has written in his blog, plenary speaking of the same phenomenon. Heartfelt thanks to all once again. We are sharing responsibility together. So let's, let's go now to our first guest this evening. I'm joined first by Plenary Council member and former chair of the Church's Truth, Justice and Healing Commission, Francis Sullivan, who heads Catholic Social Services and the Martyr Group of Hospitals. Francis, always wonderful to speak. Our focus tonight is on the Royal Commission. And we'll yes. get to that in a moment. Of course, this great crisis, which really is the prompting mechanism for the Plenary Council. You've been blogging the Plenary. We've heard a great deal over the past few days about dissatisfaction with the agenda, concerns over transparency, but also a lot of hope from those determined to make this all a worthwhile exercise. You've got a couple of days under your belt. How are you feeling about the council? Well, I think everything you said and what John's been saying in his reports is right. There's lots of enthusiasm and uh, a tremendous uh, level of genuine commitment, but uh, people do feel it's slightly rudderless. I know the answer to that's meant to be the Holy Spirit, but we are human after all. And uh, so the groups are being asked basically uh, out of the major, uh, not in the plenary, but in the small group work to undergo basically a, a, a slow, reflective, meditative process where various ideas after reflecting on the scriptures uh, come forward and hopefully stay within a theme. 
for some people that's very messy, uh, lacks control. And of course, at some point, people are wanting to get down to tin tacks and say, well, can we talk about this, that and the other? That's why, you know, it was important to make the intervention to say, hey, hold on. You know, women's participation in the church is not just one of the issues. It's the issue. Every time people come together everywhere in Australia, not just this year, not last year, but for many years. And we need to discuss it up front. We need to have proposals up front and we need to know when we can vote on it. And that is still not clear. And, and look, one of the key concerns about the Council has been that absence of major consideration around the role of women within the agenda. It does, of course, go right to the heart of the Royal Commission issues too, doesn't it? Their absence Absolutely. in senior decision-making roles, the consequent issues around transparency and accountability. You know, there are a few things that relate directly into the, to, into the Plenary Council. Obviously, the role of women. Back when the scandal was at its worst, there were no women in governance. There were no women in roles that could actually appoint priests who could hear about what was going on. There were no women literally to bring sense to the, what was a clericalist cover-up scam. That's what the Royal Commission ended up revealing, that the culture of the Catholic Church was toxic, that power, participation and privilege was skewed towards males, clerics and the entitlement club. So secrecy and cover up were the instruments used to perpetuate that culture. Breaking that culture open is part of the reasons why this plenary council is happening. But now the rub is on the plenary council. Let's not dodge the bullets. Let's make sure we keep things up front. The culture of the church, the way power is exercised, who participates in decision-making and who acts as if they are in privileged positions must be confronted and must change. You've spent years immersed in the response to the Royal Commission issues undoubtedly the gravest crisis any of us have ever seen, one of unparalleled gravity. The Plenary Council is a way forward, but talk to me again about those aspects of the institutional culture that aided the abuse and that actually still bedevil its effectiveness, as you're just suggesting. Yes, well, obviously the church was revealed to be lacking in moral leadership and being self-protective. It was not open to the other. It demonized victims. It actually demonizes anyone who really wants to have a crack and criticize, even if they're trying to criticize constructively. So there is a culture which is too closed, too um, protective of itself. And inside that, of course, they become ideologies that people sort of masquerade as theology. And so there becomes an, a, a sort of orthodoxy around what it is to be Catholic or not Catholic. And this eventually alienates. And we've seen that. You know, what is it now? Close to 90% of not people who say they are Catholic or brought up Catholic don't worship on weekends. In other words, there's this, and as always, Catholics usually just leave silently, but they've gone and they're disinterested because the tone, the style, the language, the vibe of the church no longer relates to the lives of ordinary Catholics, let alone the rest of the community. The Royal Commission asked the church in its recommendations to look at many things, to look at the influence of clericalism, to look at the way individuals are selected for the priesthood, the way they are trained, 
to looking at how people should be professionally supervised in their ministries, to looking at the engagement of the lay church in governance. All these issues are there on the table. Francis, you've written quite powerfully today in your own blog about the plight of LGBTIQA plus people. You referred to them a moment ago as rainbow people and their experience of discrimination and exclusion. And, and you noted that this resonates personally with your family, your, your own experience. For quite a lot of Catholics, it's a step too far to even contemplate a relationship with the church and rainbow people. Tell me your thinking about that in terms of the exclusion that you're referring to, the, the heterodoxy, the sense that there is one rule and one fit for the church as a whole. Yes, it was very interesting for me in, my, in the last two days as voices began to be heard in the plenary process that the voice of the rainbow people is not there. Their voice seems almost silent in the formal agenda. There's nothing explicitly asking of the members of the plenary council to raise the plight of rainbow people to an appropriate level of attention. It's almost as if the church, through its setting its agenda, is placing people who have already struggled to have their own personal identity recognised, let alone respected, they're on the margin and we've put them there. Mm -hmm. And it's not about does the church go to the margins. In this case, the church has put people on the margins. Mm -hmm. And these are people in our families. These are our friends, our brothers and sisters, our grandchildren. These are our neighbours. These are meant to be our fellow travellers on the journey, the fellow pilgrims that, um, you know, Archbishop Costello says we all are these days. And it strikes me that unless we can take the risk to be converted by the rest, we're not really understanding what Pope Francis is saying about moving into the streets. Mm. And, and certainly, as you're suggesting, Francis, in a church with an ever-diminishing active membership, with many who are within the church hanging on by their fingertips, the idea that we then create further exclusion, that the plenary council gathering needs to be pulled to the issue of women, needs to be dragged the issue of the rainbow people is an extraordinary thing to conjure with. Thank you for your presence here this evening, for your wisdom, as always, and uh, for sharing with us your experience as a member of the Plenary Council. Good luck. May you go well. Thanks, Genevieve. And, you know, I should have said at the beginning, you know, you're doing a ripper job. This is a fantastic <laughs> program. Well, look, we are enjoying doing it. It's terrific to delve into what's going on and try and get some transparency around all of this. Thank you. Um, look, let's, let's move now to our panel. This evening, my guests are Kathleen McPhillips and Anne Walker. Kathleen's a sociologist of religion at the University of Newcastle with research expertise in the sociology of religious institutions, child sexual abuse and the Royal Commission. Anne is the National Executive Director of Catholic Religious Australia and with a background in law was the former Chancellor of the Diocese of Broken Bay. And I am going to add that not only did Anne and I spend six years at school together, five of them were spent in the same very successful debating team as the first and third speakers. So if we have any Loretto nuns watching, this is what has happened to a couple of your articulate, argumentative ex-students. <laughs> Kath, I'm gonna to go to you first. We've heard from Francis about the significant issues that remain within the church post-Royal Commission. What should the Plenary Council be addressing around healing both individual and collective trauma? Is healing possible? Well, <laughs> um, <laughs> healing is definitely possible, absolutely. Um, look, I'm, I'm a sociologist, I'm not I'm, uh, sort of in 
involved in the plenary council as such, so I, I won't presume to say what I think it it should address. But I can tell you that um, the the last four years post Royal Commission has seen the rollout of the recommendations of the Royal Commission across the board in Australian institutions, and the Catholic Church has had a very um, difficult track record there uh, in meeting those recommendations. Um, the reality is that thousands of children were harmed um, since white colonisation, really, in Australian Catholic organisations. Um, well, we're saying thousands. Most victims, 80%, don't ever disclose their abuse um, because of shame and trauma. So we'll never really know the full number. Um, and the problem is that many people who do who do disclose their abuse have a second trauma, and that came through very loud and clear in the Royal Commission, um, that people who disclose to the church, either through towards healing or the Melbourne Protocol or some other fashion, um, were traumatised. But the, the other people who were traumatised were people in the Catholic community. Um, so we, we are in the midst of a living collective trauma. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And whether, whether the Plenary Council is able to address that, I, I'm... So far, I, I, I don't feel very confident, uh, given what I've just heard from Francis in regards to the process. Um, I think there is a lot that, that can happen in terms of um, healing. I think a, a lot needs to happen. Um, and um, s some of the things that I think could be at the forefront of change, for example, um, could be... Um, for example, independent mechanisms of inquiry, policy and management being put in place, and that hasn't happened yet. The church is still investigating itself, and the church, um, for example, um, the um, CPSL continually says it's independent, but it's anything but. Um, it could be, the church could be looking to ensure that survivors and their families are properly looked after financially and medically. Instead, it's kind of thrown it over to the National Redress Scheme, which is a disaster, really. And two Senate inquiries later um, has confirmed that it, it is just not meeting the needs of survivors. So if that is the case, the Catholic Church could be showing leadership here, um, and it hasn't done that. Um, it should be actively investigating perpetrators and their networks and trails in Australia and overseas. Um, and, and seeing it as an international crisis and an ongoing one, you may be aware, many people may be aware that France is about to deliver its report on child sexual abuse and the findings are pretty awful. Um, there are inquiries happening all over the world in New Zealand at the moment, in England and Wales, uh, and there are important inquiries that have happened. So we, ha we have a lot of information uh, about how, how this abuse crisis has worked as an international network. Um, it should be funding high quality independent research into child safety and protection, like Westpac did um, when it was caught supporting money laundering schemes from, uh, in, for child sexual abuse in Asia. And it should be supporting an independent investigation into violence against women and LGBTQI in Catholic communities, such as the Anglican Church has just done, um, where it found um, its findings indicated elevated levels of gendered violence uh, linked to patriarchal headship theologies. Uh, some of those theologies are incredibly um, resonant with the gender ideologies that are common in um, Catholicism. So, those are just some of the ways that I think um, the church needs to sort of move forward. But there's a long way to go and it's, it's barely begun and it has spent a lot of time developing a powerful rhetoric about how well it is doing. But when you look closely, um, not much has changed. The culture is remaining absolutely clericalised and resilient to that. And with, with regard to this, there's no particular mention of safeguarding in the agenda for the Plenary Council. Is that conversation about safeguarding still current? Where's the focus on the abused? Where's the focus on the fundamental duty to keep people safe? I think you're still on mute, Anne. Yes, <laughs> thank go. you. <laughs> Lots of questions in that, Genevieve. Um, as you said, the Royal Commission cemented the need for this plenary council. So it is 
still a huge, huge issue for the church. And as Kathleen said, not just in Australia, but worldwide, France is about to reveal horrible information and statistics as well. So as the sexual abuse crisis is the single biggest crisis for the church in our time, because of the harm inflicted on children, but also because of the way it shone the light and name, name some of our most significant flaws you know, that, that Francis has spoken to today. It should definitely be a key item on the agenda. It should be explicit that safeguarding needs to be um, named and continued to be actioned. There is a lot that has been done and there is still a lot that needs to be done. But the fact that it's not named explicitly is problematic, as has already been discussed about women and LGBTIQIA plus people. It's the lack of explicit nature that concerns me because we can all talk around matters, but it's actually getting down to the details, the proposals, what does it mean, how's it lived. So part of that is, I'm not suggesting that the Plenary Council is the place to solve safeguarding issues, but it is the place to name that safeguarding has to be kept front and centre. It's vital at all levels, mm -hmm. including the PC. It's a framework, in fact, from which all other ministry flows. Um, I, I do have a fear that, you know, the RC is over and the conversation is done and dusted. You know, like lest we forget, like never again as the cry for the Holocaust survivors, we have to keep the conversation alive. And if it's not alive at the highest levels, it's of concern. I believe from my experience, which may be different from Kathleen's, is that there is a lot happening on the ground. In particular areas, there's a whole heap of change that's been happening. Are we there yet? Absolutely not. Will we ever be there? Probably not. It's always going to be about moving culture. It's always going to be about increasing accountability, transparency. But not having the conversation at the Plenary Council is of concern. There are oblique references to, you know, heal the wounds of abuse, meeting the needs of the most vulnerable governance issues. Um, we all know that's pointing to issues raised in the Royal Commission, but it's not enough. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm disappointed um, that it's not explicit and that it's not the focus of a conversation. We know there's lots of talk about compliance, but there's a necessity to bring the hearts and minds along with that to effect a cultural change that is across the church to bring the hearts and minds along on that compliance journey. And, and there is a challenge, though, isn't there, in the disconnect between church teaching and meeting the Royal Commission standards on safeguarding children and those at risk. There's this enduring tension in the church's relationship with the secular state. Absolutely. In, in a few areas, but one, I suppose, in particular that, that seems to have been glossed over in some areas is that we know, we know that marginalisation places children and adults at risk as the new standards are moving to, at greater risk. It makes them more vulnerable to abuse of all sorts. And then the, the National Catholic Safeguarding Standards specifically refer to diverse sexuality and requires entities to pay particular attention to the needs of children with diverse sexuality. And yet we know the church's teachings. So draft two of those standards actually increase the obligation on entities. They actually require them to respect their inherent dignity and that the policies and procedures are inclusive and responsive. So knowing the church is teaching in this area and yet the expectation, which, which increases marginalisation and puts children and adults at risk, um, at greater risk, because we're all aware of the high rates of suicide for LGBTQIA plus youth in particular in society. So the standards requiring inclusivity, inherent respect for people of diverse sexuality sits in absolute tension with the theology that the church is teaching, the exclusion of course of LGBTQI plus. So there's a huge challenge for practitioners, for leaders, to deal with that, those the conflict between the standards. And I'm not seeing in the agenda allowance for the tension 
grappling with the tension. We've got to be able to, to name these challenges and then move through them to find a way to really live what we're called to live, the safeguarding of all, the protection of the dignity of all, and be inclusive, you know, follow Jesus' teaching, follow what the Pope is asking for us. And I think that's missing. Uh, Kath, I know you have some thoughts on the church being a special institution, and that's enabled church leaders to avoid implementing recommendations from the Royal Commission around state regulation, transparency. The church is currently exempt from human rights legislation, which protects it in a number of ways, including dismissing staff whose beliefs are contrary to their employers. Can we deliver equity and fairness to marginalised groups if there's unlikely to be anything binding on the church regarding inclusion other than goodwill and good intentions? Well, I guess the short answer to that is no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, in, in my work, um, I've been working with a group of colleagues um, and researchers who are trying to reframe the whole, um, the whole term religion. And so what we're doing is um, we're, we're deconstructing the, the term religion, but also tradition. And we're in fact looking at religion as forms of statecraft. And when you shift it into that framework, it's really effective. Like um, what you can see is that in fact, what, what we have in the church is a modern monarchical patriarchal institution. It's got two arms, it's got a corporate body, it's got a pastoral body. The corporate, bo the corporate, corporate church is very strong and powerful which I think, Anne, is, is where you were sort of going when you were saying that there have been a lot of changes on the ground. I'm not sure about how many, how much change has happened pastorally. Um, but also I think um, the Catholic work Church does wield a, a huge amount of economic and political power. It's got its own legal code, its court system. Um, and it's, it is because it is a religion exempt from, from human rights laws certain human rights laws, most of which are um, about gender equity. Um, and so it can implement this very conservative and, and um, um, difficult um, agenda in terms of employment and the treatment of workers. So you could see it as a kind of quasi state really, uh, where it, it, it just doesn't have an army and a police force. And the thing about the secular state is that it has allowed this to happen. I mean, it is embedded it legally uh, in the constitution. And um, so it's kind of the secular state really is, has been complicit in the CSA crisis, sorry, the child sexual abuse crisis in that way. Um, and we should be clear about that. And we should also be very skeptical of the ways in which church leaders talk about the word tradition, because I think tradition really veils a lot of things. Um, it hides the fact that the church is actually very modern um, and that it does sort of um, it has a modern management and theology, and it, but it claims that it's sort of unable to change. In, in fact, the Archbishop of Sydney said that last week. Um, we're a very old historical institution. We find it very difficult to change. That's not true. It changes all the time. Um, and, and one of the ways in which it, it managed to change a lot was the way it managed the child sexual abuse crisis, the way it hid it um, and protected perpetrators and treated um, victims so appallingly. So I think, you know, um, when, when we're looking at this, it's, it's sort of is useful to see it as a sort of quasi state. Once you do that, you can then uh, begin to understand its relationship to the secular state and ask the question of why does the secular state allow this small group of institutions to be privileged? Um, when in 2012, when the human rights laws were um, being revised, um, I read every submission. There were hundreds of submissions and um, nearly all of the submissions from the church group said, don't change the laws because there are privileges here. Um, the only church that didn't, that, that argued to, to, to change the laws was the Uniting Church, which said all religions should be the same kinds of institutions as, um, as secular institutions. And really it's, it's no... Um, you know, it's, it's no wonder that religious organisations were the worst offenders at the Royal Commission. You know, it wasn't just the Catholic Church was the worst, but it wasn't. There were nearly every other um, religious organisation um, had very problematic ways. And it's because they were flying under the radar uh, and the secular state allows them to do that. 
Thank you both indeed for a really fascinating look at some of the challenges for us post-Royal Commission for the Australian Church. These are really substantial issues. You've both spoken to the great problems around marginalisation for the LGBTIAQ plus community, and the community of divorced Catholics, anyone who isn't a good fit for expectations about sexuality and relationships. And of course, we've got a huge amount to conjure with. Um, my guests have been Catherine Phillips and Anne Walker. Let's move now to your questions via our moderator. Danielle Lynch is with us. She's a teacher and musician. She's head of religion in a Catholic secondary school and a sessional lecturer in theology at the Australian Catholic University. Danielle, how are people responding this evening? What do they want to know? Well, thank you for having me. I join you from the lands of the Gobby Gobby people north of Brisbane. And there's some great responses to this evening's discussion, some really informed perspectives coming across. One of the points that I'd like to begin with is that people are mentioning abuse in the Catholic Church is far more broad ranging than we might just get from this conversation on sexual abuse. And therefore it includes things like clericalism, bullying, and lots of other different forms. So Kath, I wonder if I can come back to you first on this and say, has the abuse stopped and how do we know? Um, the abuse hasn't stopped. <laughs> No, uh, I do know anecdotally of cases, of course, and um, I, I think one of the mistakes is is if we think of the abuse as historical, um, and uh, that that means that people are able to put it put it in the past and say that's where it happened, um, and it's not what is happening in the church at the moment. But if you look at gender violence in Australia generally, um, the numbers, of the, the the violence against women and children in particular is is as high as it has always been, um, and um, so there, there it's it's an absolute concern. The the report that's just come out on the Anglican Church uh, about gendered violence in the Anglican Church raised real concerns about elevated levels of violence against women. Um, there hasn't been, as far as I know, any kind of similar research in the Catholic Church. I think it does need to be done because, um, you know, we need to look at whether the sort of gender theologies are sort of um, having any kind of input into this. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it is um, a real concern here about other kinds of abuse um, that is still happening. And, you know, I mean, um, we looked at ch children with a focus in the Royal Commission for very good reason. And it's, its remit did not allow it to look outside of that, but there are other vulnerable groups of people uh, who have made claims through towards healing and the Melbourne Protocol, um, vulnerable adults in particular. Um, and um, that's probably not as well known, but that there is a culture of abuse in the church that it goes to the heart of the culture of this hierarchical patriarchy that really needs to be addressed um, quickly. Thanks, Kath. That's exceedingly worrying for those of us who are in those church circles. I wonder, Anne, if I could come to you with the next question. Someone, a survivor of abuse, has raised the issue of being re-traumatized by legal processes, by it not actually fixing anything in the church. You talked a little about safeguarding and the processes. I wonder if there's anything you can talk to on that about the re-traumatization through the church processes through the way in which that abuse is dealt with? Um, unfortunately, I totally agree, except that that happens. Um, it should be absolutely front and center of any response to any, any, connect, uh, any communication that um, a church authority and entity receives. So I can give you an example this week, um, last week, I received two calls and they were both totally opposite. One was, because um, we don't actually, we don't deal with complaints directly, but I get a lot of queries about where do we go, how do we manage it? Um, these are the roadblocks I'm coming up against. One was um, asking me about that they had contacted a, an entity and had got the runaround. And then when the person finally got called back, the, the call, the call, the person who called was rude and hostile. I'm glad to say at least it wasn't one of our religious institutes, but it happened and it shouldn't happen. The second call I got was from an, a lady who had rung me before and said, 
should I contact this leader? What will happen? And then I spoke to her, encouraged her to make the call. Then she came back to me last week and said, the call I, I, was, I was responded to instantly. And since I made the contact, I have been treated with care and compassion throughout. Neither of those people talked to me about what had happened to them. Neither talk about the process, the outcome, the decisions, anything like that. It was only about how they were treated. And it is absolutely key, and I think a huge gap in our safeguarding practices, that we focused on compliance, which we have to, reporting, knowing, um, knowing what to do, who to report to, who's responsible, all of the, the work of safeguarding is a, should be a given by now, it should be a given. What I don't think there is enough focus on is the people, the, the capacity to walk with and accompany those who've been abused in the first place. And that's where there needs to be more conversation around not just the work of safeguarding and the compliance, because it has been, um, there's been a, a kind of a big stick approach, the work of compliance, but then there's the work of accompaniment. And that's a huge gap. And it breaks my heart when I hear that within the church, we don't do that well. There needs to be more conversation about that. And I think a lot of it comes from fear still. So when we fear, we don't see the other person. We're kind of blocked with our own fear. So we can't hear, we can't respond. And that, of course, happened throughout the Royal, the Royal Commission brought that to light historically. So I would say that there, in my view, there is a lot better response a lot more widespread good responding but it hasn't it's not fixed by no means and I would like to see more around a national conversation around that how do we actually accompany so we don't re-traumatize it's an awful thing to hear and see the effect of the re-traumatization thanks Anne and Francis I'll come to you with a question about what our expectations might be from this plenary council we are thinking about, in terms of apologies, can we expect an apology? Can we expect the National Bishops' Conference to take leadership on this? Are we relying solely on local clergy or bishops? Or should other organisations take the lead on this? Who would be responsible in moving forward in this area? Well, thank you for that question. <clears throat> Let me say, firstly, I'm an optimist about the plenary council process. I think it's hard and it's messy at the moment, but I'd have to say, and I think most of the uh, members are positively engaged for the long haul. We know this is going to be maybe a nine month process. So, you know, I think we all um, have a, a quite a ground of hope. And one of the reasons why I say that is in our conversations already, things are percolating to the top. And I'll be making sure, obviously, when I'm in my conversations, that my experience through the Royal Commission years and the issues come to the fore. And I've already heard some people say, you know, we need to do something quite explicit about the church's contrition, the atonement that's required. And one of those issues could well be some major statement, um, this time in a more profound way. I know that many religious leaders Many bishops over the years have made very strong, heartfelt statements of apology. And some of them collectively between ACBC and CRA. So it's not as if it's not in the mindset. I think what we're talking about now is also, as they say, sacrament and sign. We need symbolism. The church is good at symbolism. So now we need to use it in a way that can engage people in a sense of, meaningful communication. So yes, I'm an optimist. I think things are going to happen. We look forward to it. And just to come back, Francis, another question about the plenary that's come in. We talked a little bit about, about the marginalization of various groups of people, about queer groups of people, about other vulnerable groups, about children. The question is, what's off limits? Is there anything that's not on the table? Can we talk about queer people as marginalized? And also noting the point that the church is the margins. It's not that the church is going to the margins, but actually queer people are church. So 
what is off limits? What's on the table? The voices are not being heard currently, you said, but how do we get that through? Well, I think that comes down to the members. Um, Archbishop uh, Coleridge from the word go said that everything's on the table. Now we've had some people say that the uh, way the canon laws work, some things can't be uh, progressed at the Australian level, it has to be progressed at the universal church level. But that doesn't mean we can't discuss these things here, uh, pass resolutions here that may bind the, the bishops and others, hopefully, that take the issues into the universal church and advocate from what the Australian church has advocated itself. So everything theoretically is on the table. It comes down to members speaking up. And therefore, people around the process between now and July next year, as you get to know who the members are, lobby them. Let them know that you want something on the table if you haven't heard that it wasn't raised. Thanks, Francis. And Kathleen, we'll come back to you with a question. You've mentioned a lot of secular ways, that a lot of secular organisations follow certain protocol and some ways in which you would expect the church to move forward. And some people are questioning that it's also related to canon law doctrine. What is the relation between those things? And can the plenary council really address the foundation of the abuse if it's focused on canon law rather than on secular processes? Um, wow, that's a, that's a big one. I mean, um, canon law has played and is playing a very important part in the management of the child sexual abuse crisis. And a lot of that is driven from the Vatican. And um, there have been some quite significant changes there in terms of um, changing, changing canon law. Um, there were some significant changes recently um, that criminalised child sexual abuse, um, which really takes it back to prior to the 20th century when that was changed. So, so that, that's a really good move. Um, but I, th I think it does, it does point to the fact that there, there is canon law and that clerics are, um, that is the law that they, they are obliged to follow. But uh, again, there's also secular law. This goes back to what I was saying about it's, it's kind of like two states within one nation. Um, and it, there was a lot of confusion at the Royal Commission about um, what, what where were the responsibilities of the church in relation to canon law and in relation to, to secular law? Um, obviously, the Royal Commission is a secular, uh, secular um, state, state uh, secular organisation. So it, it was strongly saying that it was secular law that had to be followed here. Um, and I think canon law, it did a lot of harm. Everybody knows that. Um, it, 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 it construed... Um, um, child sexual abuse is a sort of spiritual issue. Um, it, it had a, a law around secrecy provisions um, that where the knowledge about child abuse could not be shared. And, and the Vatican sat on a lot of cases for a long time. So there are huge problems. I mean, it, there's sort of problems of bureaucracies really. Um, so I, I think, um, that hasn't really been resolved. I mean, we have seen a lot of, we've seen goodwill there and um, in, in moving forward, but it's just, uh, I think for a lot of people, it's just not moving fast enough. And I think um, the recommendations of the Royal Commission that the Catholic Church needs to look at its culture and change canon law have been too slow for many people. Thanks, Kath. And Anne, I'll come back to you with one final question. We've had some conversation tonight about the hope, hope that people have moving forwards, the Pope, his move towards synodality, the impact that's having, the new paradigm of the new wineskins. And so someone's asking, should we be organizing a lay center synod? Should we be taking the power away from the clerics? Should we be doing something on the side? Or are there other new wineskins that you can see us having hope in? Um, big question, another one. I'm sure Francis has got something to say on this. Um, look, my view is that I am still hopeful that we can continue to work together. 
So we have ordained, we have lay people. And of course, lay people includes the brothers and the sisters. Um, we have to find a place where we don't have margins. We have to find a place where there's inclusions, inclusion. So if we get, if we need to get there by having more synods to work out how we work together, then that's what we will need to do. But at this stage, I'm hopeful that with Mark Coleridge saying that nothing is off, off the table, then the Holy Spirit will move things along faster than I, I think that if there, do, if, it, if there isn't huge change in all of these areas that we've been talking about, then the, there's a big question about where is the church? What is the church? What's left of the church? The people of God are the church. And there's, it's time now to listen to what that means with the Holy Spirit guiding the way, opening the ears and, and opening the, the books of canon law to rewrite aspects. Let's hope we're listening to the Spirit and she's moving us along swiftly. Genevieve, I'm going to pass back over to you with great thanks for our panellists tonight. And thank you too so much, Danielle. Look, tomorrow night we'll be discussing governance, which, as it turns out, is a very key issue, how the church is run, who's running it, what needs to be done differently. It's been a major focus for reform groups in the lead up to the plenary. We've discussed it extensively tonight with regard to the Royal Commission. So what next for these ancient old world models in an Australian church? Thanks to all of our speakers, to Francis Sullivan, to Anne Walker, and to Kathleen McPhillips, to Daniel for moderating. And we look forward to sharing another vigorous discussion with you tomorrow evening. Thank you.